I start my message, I'd like for John Mullen to come and read our passage for today. Our passage is Acts chapter 3, and I've invited John Mullen to come and uh, read the passage for us. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, at three in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going to the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, Look at us. So the man gave him his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, Silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up. Instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit and beg. So he used to be sitting and begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why are you staring at us as if by our own power or godliness we have made this man walk? the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though Pilate had decided to let him go. You disowned the Holy and Righteous One and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man, whom you see and know, was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can all see. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything, as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. For Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from their people. Indeed, beginning with Samuel, all the prophets who have spoken have foretold these days, and you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, Through your offspring, all peoples on earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant Jesus, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. Thank you, John. I've called this message, The God 
of second chances. Have you ever dreamt about payback? Have you ever wanted to get even for a wrong that was done to you? In soccer, you know, playing, playing in soccer, if I got tripped, boy, I'd want to get up and, and trip that guy back. You know, get even. It's in our nature to want to repay evil for evil. Joseph, he was sold into slavery by his brothers. And years later, Joseph was raised to a position of authority and had the chance to get back at his brothers. But Joseph, who valued God's promise to his family, was a type of Christ. And as such, he put mercy first, even when he had the perfect opportunity for revenge. And you know, in the same way, Jesus, during his earthly ministry, he taught the value of absolute necessity of forgiveness. As Messiah, he had the authority to set aside the ancient eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth policy. But someone has said, if we followed that eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth, we'd all be blind and we'd all have false teeth in our mouths. Our passage for today, Acts chapter 3, takes place in Jerusalem, just weeks after the men of Israel had mocked, condemned, shamed, and crucified Jesus. Much to everybody's surprise, the death of Jesus didn't put an end to Jesus' influence. In this chapter, Jesus is again making his resurrection presence known at Jerusalem. And if it was me returning to a people who had done me wrong, I'd be seeking vengeance, payback, and I'd make life difficult for those who had done me wrong. But Acts chapter 3, it's not about payback. The resurrection of Jesus demonstrate his, demonstrates his power, his authority, but not in a way that would be expected of someone who had been wronged. Instead, Jesus offers people mercy and a means of redemption. And so the story, Acts chapter 3, it takes place just after Pentecost. Peter and John, they were circulating freely. They weren't hiding from the Jewish authorities. And they were going into the temple to pray. And they get to the main gate of the temple called Beautiful. The work of man's hands is beautiful. And it's named in contrast to a certain humble man that they meet. This humble man, the work of God's hand, but who is unnamed and certainly not beautiful, but instead is a 40-year-old cripple from birth. The people probably had judgment on their minds, wondering as they passed by him, was it his sin or his parents' sin that made him as he was? And as Peter and John were passing by that beautiful gate, their eyes didn't dwell on the work of man's hands, but instead on a man created in God's image, but who had been marginalized from birth. And Peter and John, they look at him, they make eye contact with him, they validate him, they hold on to him by the arm, and they help him to stand. And hence we get the inspiration from that chorus from the 60s or 70s. Remember that? Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And they went walking and leaping and praising God. And that really drew the attention of the crowd. And Peter and John, they used this opportunity as a teaching moment. Peter tries to connect the dots for the Jews. The people, they knew the scriptures, 
but hadn't connected the scriptures to Jesus. And Peter preaches in such a way to help the people make that connection between the scriptures that they were familiar with and this person, Jesus, that they had just crucified. And remarkably, Peter said that the people had acted in ignorance. They hadn't understood what they were doing. It's as if the Holy Spirit grabbed a hold of Peter and said, okay, let's see if we can try again. Now that we have the attention of the crowd, let's help them make the connection. Let's give them a second chance. And so I think that the story about the healing isn't about, isn't so much the healing of, the, of this unnamed man, but it's the healing of the people and how they came to realize the, the greater importance of, of what Christ had done. These very people who had made a bad decision were given the opportunity to learn and to benefit from God's grace. Well, let's take a look at some of these characters in the story. We know that the certain man was lame from birth. He was about 40 years old. And because of his physical state, he wasn't allowed to enter into the temple. He could only look on and watch others going back and forth. He was kind of on the fringes of society and on the fringes of religion as well. If he was 40 years old, maybe he remembered Joseph and Mary bringing a baby into the temple. Maybe he had seen a young 12-year-old Jesus going in and out of the temple and asking questions uh, about, from the religious leaders. And Jesus, during his public ministry, he would have been performing healing and miracles. They may have known this Jesus as a miracle worker. And at Pentecost, so many people have been healed. But he was probably wondering, why hadn't he had a chance to be healed? Why was he passed over? When was it going to be his turn to be the recipient of God's grace after 40 years? And then you had the crowd. All around this certain man were the hustling and bustling people going in and out of the temple preoccupied with the correctness of their religious obligations. And those were the same people that had cried, crucify him, only a few weeks before. And so according to this human sense of justice, if Jesus was present even in spirit, he should have taught them a severe lesson. He should have given them what they deserved for the crucifixion. At the very least, he should have just ignored them because they had been given so many opportunities, but yet refused to believe. But Jesus did the unimaginable and gave his tormentors another chance to understand and to repent. And then you have Peter, who bravely declared that he would sit at Christ's right hand, but when things got hot, he fled and denied his Lord. Now was Peter again, who had the rapt attention of the crowd. He could no longer deny his Lord. And Peter, at one time, he had aspired to greatness. And there he was, facing an admiring crowd. Peter could have instantly had 10,000 followers if he had said, follow me and I'll teach you how to do signs and wonders. But instead, he deflects the attention from himself back to Jesus. Men of Israel, why do you gaze at us as if by our own power or our own piety we're able to make him walk? Don't look at us. Look at Jesus. We don't have that power and piety. 
but I'll tell you about someone who does. Jesus had recently explained to the disciples those things concerning himself in all of the scriptures. And Jesus had walked them through the Bible and explained what those scriptures said about himself. And those ideas must have been fresh on Peter's mind as he began to explain to the people. Peter had connected the dots between the Old Testament prophecies and the work of Jesus. And now he wants the crowd to understand what Peter had come to understand. Then you have Peter who talks about Jesus, who presents Jesus. And he says a number of things about Jesus that he's understood. The first thing he says in verse 13 is that Jesus is the servant prophesied by Isaiah. You know, the notion of the Messiah as being the servant of God, it was well known in Jewish thinking. Isaiah talks about the the servant songs, and Isaiah talks about the suffering servant. And so by calling Jesus a servant of the Lord, Peter was helping the crowd to make the connection. This is the one that your great prophets had, had prophesied about. Don't you understand what he's done for you? And then Peter calls Jesus holy and righteous in verse 14. Peter said it wasn't by our holiness, it wasn't by our righteousness that the person was healed. But there is one who is holy. And remember, even back in the the Pentateuch, uh, in in Genesis, uh, God is the Holy One of Israel. God was identified by his holiness. And so the description of Christ as the Holy One, it was something that Peter had understood too. It was personal for Peter because several years ago, as recorded in John chapter 6, remember Jesus had preached and the crowd was offended or confused or something and so much of the crowd left and Jesus turned to the disciples and asked, are you going to leave too? And Peter said, we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Peter had understood it. He got it. And Peter calls him the Holy and the Righteous. So it's kind of asserting that Jesus is not only the Holy God, but also a righteous, sinless man. We've come to believe And we want you, men of Israel, we want you to do the same. We want you to believe too. Another thing that Peter says about Jesus is that he's the prince of life. It means that Jesus is the author of life, the source of life, the one from which salvation flows, the captain of salvation, if you will. The crowd who had crucified Jesus had chosen a murderer, one who destroys life in place of the prince of life, the one who gives life. Then Peter uses the authority of Moses to point to Jesus. In verse 22 of this chapter, Peter cites Deuteronomy 18 where Moses said, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. To him you shall give heed to everything he says to you. So Moses was speaking about Jesus. Because Moses said that God will raise up a prophet like me. And so Peter is trying to tell the, the crowd, don't you make the connection? It was Moses who spoke of Jesus, who prophesied about Jesus. Don't you get it? And then Peter, he uses the authority of Abraham, the patriarch, the one who is the patriarch that Jews and Christians and Muslims look to as their their father. And way back in Genesis chapter 12, the covenant that God made with Abraham, where it says, and in your seed, all the families of the earth 
will be blessed. And so Peter is saying that, remember that promise to Abraham that you all know about? Well, it's Jesus who is the seed of Abraham. And the fulfillment of the promise of Abraham that through his descendants, all the families of the earth are going to be blessed. Well, the crowd, they were in the temple in the most holy spot where all the sin offerings are brought, where atonement was made, yet they're being told to repent, to change, to return to God. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come for the presence of the Lord. The Jews, they placed all their confidence in the temple, in the rituals, the beautiful gates, the things that filled them with awe and order. But Peter is saying, all these things, they should have turned you to God. But you missed it. And you need to repent. You need to repent because this is what you've done. And he lists their sins, the errors that they've done. Verse 13, you denied the Lord. And that word denial, that was personal for Peter because Peter was guilty of denying the Lord too. So Peter could have been telling the crowd, I denied him too, just like you, but he gave me a second chance. What else did you do that you need to repent for? You disowned. You threw him away. But you can reclaim him again. He is still within reach even though you discarded him. And another thing that they need to repent for is they put to death Jesus. But God undid what they had done. They had destroyed the life of Jesus, but God raised him up again. God can make all things new. The lo- our lives that we have destroyed, God's able to raise up again and give us a second chance. You put to death a life, but God's able to make all things new, to give new life. So Peter says, here are the facts. You denied, you disowned, you put to death, but you can still make it right. Repent and turn and change your mind and mend your ways Call upon Jesus, whom you have treated wrongfully. And then you'll have some benefits. If you repent, here are the benefits of your repentance. Firstly, your sins will be blotted out. Back in those days, the writing, the ink didn't sink into the parchment. You could just take a a piece of damp cloth or water and wipe the the names off, wipe the writing off, and it shows that God can remove, he can cancel, he can blot out any trace of the account against us. What's another benefit besides having your sins blotted out? Times of refreshment will come to your life. God can pour out his refreshing grace upon our lives. Jesus said, come to me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Don't look at other places for refreshment. Come to me. I'll pour out my refreshing grace upon you. Another benefit is that it will be spared the promise of judgment. All sin results in judgment, but the penalty has been paid. We're forgiven. Judgment no longer falls upon us because that penalty has been paid in Jesus. And finally, the fourth benefit is that Jesus turns his eye of blessing upon us as we turn away from our sins. And he helps steer us away from our sins and helps us leave our wicked ways and puts us on paths of righteousness. So Acts chapter 3 we see remarkable blessings. Jesus, by his Spirit, is still present and working among his people. The Holy Spirit is doing remarkable and unexpected 
things among them. People are healed. The gospel is being preached with power and authority. And the crowds that were hostile, they have turned and they're starting to become friendly. Who am I in this passage? Where do I see myself in this passage? In some respects, I'm the lame beggar, seeking fulfillment in life from handouts from other people, affirmations, the attaboys, the kudus that people give me from this society. Who am I? I'm a face in the crowd, going along with the flow of culture, parroting what society says I should do, rather than measuring my values by the eternal word of God. Who am I in this story? I'm a disciple who in critical times fails to stand up for what I know is right. Who am I? I'm a member of sinful humanity, boldly going into a holy space where I don't belong, except by the power of the Holy One of Israel, who blotted out my transgressions and who has spared me from judgment and who offers me, a wretched sinner, his second chance, his blessing. God can undo the trouble that I've gotten myself into. Our God is a God of second chances. So I'd like to conclude with two illustrations. One is a personal illustration from uh, an ex missionary experience uh, and the second one is uh, an article from uh, uh, latest edition of Christianity Today. So when I was a young missionary, uh, this was uh, many, many years ago, we were at a place called Mwanza. And uh, there was a lot of disease and illness in the Mwanza area. And the people invited a sorcerer to come into the area. And I confronted the sorcerer and I was chased by an angry mob. I had to run for my life because I was chased by this angry mob. We weren't at Mwanza very long, we moved away. Oh, this picture here is, uh, was the next day after I'd been chased by the mob. The man who came to see me was the sorcerer. He said when he was in the midst of his incantations, he felt his power diminish from 10 to 2 and didn't know what was going on. So he came to find me to find out what the greater power is that I knew about. And he received Christ and I gave him a Bible. That was the, the day after that picture is. Fast forward then to two weeks before we left Congo. The people of Mwanza sent a delegation to Kikongo to meet with me. They said, ever since you were at Mwanza, things just haven't been going well at Mwanza. We feel guilty for having chased out a missionary. And we're feeling like we're stagnant and we're not advancing. And so they gave me a plaque. They gave me a gift which sits in my office. And they said, Mr. Glenn, Mwanza vous demande pardon sincère et vous dit au revoir. Mwanza is asking you for a sincere pardon and says uh, uh, goodbye to you. So the whole village, Mwanza, sent that delegation to ask forgiveness. Fast forward to this year, we got a letter from the medical coordinator who's working in Congo. And she said, she just returned from Mwanza, where they have just completed a surgery building that they built with their own resources. And that Mwanza is the shining star in the medical infrastructure of the Baptist community in Congo. It's like they had asked for pardon 
and they were given a second chance, and the Lord was blessing them. The second uh, illustration that I conclude with is the April issue of Christianity Today. There's an article entitled, uh, The Sentence from C.S. Lewis That Could Change Your Life. And it's a quote taken from uh, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. It says that uh, Edmund had betrayed his siblings, goaded on by the white witch and a taste of Turkish delight. And after an entire narrative leading the reader to despise the treasonous brat, Aslan the lion and rightful ruler of Narnia appeared and walked a sheepish and defeated Edmund back to the others. Here's your brother, he said, and there's no need to talk to him about what is past. Aslan, Aslan is fictional. We can go to the next, uh, the final slide. Aslan is fictional, but the real Lion of Judah reminds us that we're forgiven and we're given the opportunity for a second chance. Let us pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you don't give us what we deserve. Thank you that you gave us a second chance in spite of ourselves. Thank you that in spite of the daily errors that we make, in spite of our daily unbelief and rebellion, that you give us a second and a third and a fourth and a 70 times seven chance. Thank you, Father, for your mercy, for your special love for us as your people. Lord, work in our lives. Touch our hearts that we may reflect your glory and your character. We pray in Jesus' name.